So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, this is our next uh, uh, workshop in our series of uh, tutorials on how to uh, use our whole system. Today we are very happy to have Joshua Yayu Lin, who is going to give us a tutorial on PyTorch. Uh, Joshua is a PhD student in the physics department. He delivered this tutorial last semester, and this was uh, one very popular tutorial uh, that a lot of students found it to be very useful. So we're very happy that Joshua is able to join us today again and then deliver the same tutorial. Uh, as usual, this tutorial will be recorded so you can watch it online. Um, so Joshua, please take it from here. Yeah, uh, so thanks Vlad for invitation again. And thank you um, all for attending uh, the training session as well. And uh, thanks for accommodating my time uh, to hold a special time on Tuesday. I really appreciate it. Um, so I think this is going to be um, my uh, this is going to be uh, introductions on PyTorch. So um, as Vlad uh, said that uh, I gave similar uh, tutorial um, last semester. So I mean, if uh, you're interested in some of the documentations and the, all the slides, I think I post everything in the chat. You can find a GitHub link that will link you to all the slides and notebook right there, which I'm going to use uh, for today's presentations. And uh, during the uh, during during this presentation, feel free to stop me if you have uh, any questions. And also, please uh, please let me know like uh, if there's uh, any issues on your hand. I think uh, there'll be people who are willing to help you uh, resolve this issue. So um, the way I like to uh, have this um, basically tutorial is like I would first. Uh, give you some slides to give you some broad idea about what PyTorch is. And then we'll jump to a few examples actually using uh, a Collapse notebook. But uh, if you're uh, familiar with HAL and you have uh, access to uh, HAL these days, then you can uh, or also feel free to uh, run your codes right there, uh, which uh, should be pretty straightforward. And so before we start, um, I feel like maybe I should just first introduce myself a little bit since uh, I might be new to some of the people right here. So my name is Joshua. Uh, uh, I'm a final year PhD student in physics. Uh, my research has uh, mainly been involved in machine learning applications uh, for astrophysics. And some of the topics include dark matter and supermassive black holes. And these days, I'm broadly interested in the intersection of uh, machine learning and natural science. And uh, so, and also like uh, while well, uh, last year, I also spent some time uh, working at a place like Science Foundation and Google Research as intern. So uh, if you're also interested in that experience, uh, feel free to ping me afterwards. And um, today, uh, I'm very glad to talk about PyTorch, which is one of the tools I personally love a lot. And I usually uh, use PyTorch to build most of my deep learning projects. So I'm very e excited to share about what PyTorch is. So the agenda of this talk is that uh, first, I'm going to give you some overview about what PyTorch is and some high level uh, description about what deep learning is. And then first, I'll go to a notebook that gives you some idea about how PyTorch works. Uh, what it looks like and how do you operate and like do things with PyTorch. And then we are going to train a very simple convolutional neural network to classify what we call the MNIST, the handwritten digits data, uh, just directly using uh, PyTorch. And then I'm going to give you an example of how to you, uh, use PyTorch to build one of the uh, pretty popular uh, generative model called a variational autoencoder to generate some of the new data that uh, haven't seen before. And uh, I think in the end, then uh, I'll basically have a QA and a sections right there. Right, so um, to begin with, like uh, I'm going to give you some really broad idea about uh, what deep learning is and what AI is, what machine learning is. So basically in some broad sense, like artificial intelligence is that as long as you have a systems that um, whether it's hard-coded or some learning algorithm that basically try to mimic human uh, intelligence, for example, like uh, IBM Deep Blue built a, a pretty uh, hard-coded uh, machine called Deep Blue, which uh, played chess and beat uh, Gary Kasparov, which was a chess uh, champion at the time. 
And the algorithm itself, it's uh, considered um, one of the algorithm for artificial intelligence. And machine learning is just a sub-branch or subfield of artificial intelligence that involve with a learning algorithm that actually learns from data. And one of the famous examples is that you're probably using, are using email these days and uh, the algorithm that sort of classify whether an email is spam or not, just like some people might have labeled it like uh, a spam earlier than whenever you have a new email coming in, your algorithm already learned from previous data. So it can automatically classify um, new incoming emails into spam or not spam. And deep learning is uh, one of the uh, subfield in machine learning, which I found really exciting. And the reason why it called deep is that it involved with something we call the deep neural network these days. And a deep neural network has been, uh, or deep learning has been showing really promising results on uh, lots of different domains, uh, most famously for uh, its uh, ability to uh, do things in computer visions that you can use it to uh, recognize cats and dogs or lots of different images. And also like uh, these days, it's also quite uh, popular for something we call the natural language processing, which um, I think people train um, large uh, models to like basically try to uh, uh, learn how to represent uh, different uh, languages and do machine translations. And so the key behind those deep learning is something we call the deep neural networks. And to usually build neural network, you need to have some really good uh, tools or pipeline, including both from software side and hardware side to, to be able to do so. So which is uh, why I'm going to uh, give you some idea about what PyTorch is today. And also before jumping into details, like I just want to give you some idea about uh, what uh, machine learning is and basically broadly can be ca characterized into two types. One is called supervised learning, which, and the other is called unsupervised learning. And the biggest difference between them is that usually uh, supervised, when we do supervised learning, usually it's something we call a label is provided right there. For example, like if you have cat's image, then someone will label like this is a cat. And while unsupervised learning is usually you have a bunch of data, but you don't really have a label thing that. And um, in uh, supervised learning, usually you can do classifications, like you want to tell whether one type is this, or you can also do something we call regression, which is like you could also directly uh, estimate the value. Uh, for example, like you are looking at an image and you are maybe trying to estimate like uh, what's a uh, um, specific values in that images. And that's something that we will call regression. Um, um, so like that's a brief uh, introduction about what uh, machine learning and deep learning is. Then the next question we have is like, uh, why, why, what is PyTorch? Uh, because it's uh, in the title. So uh, basically PyTorch is an open source uh, machine learning libraries um, um, for you to do uh, basically a uh, lot of uh, uh, research in uh, deep learning. And it's actually developed by uh, Facebook or maybe I should say Meta these days uh, research labs. And uh, it leverages the powers of GPUs because like you, when you train, usually when you train a uh, deep learning algorithm, usually uh, it will process way faster when you can train on GPUs instead of CPUs. So PyTorch is one of the framework that are pretty uh, excellent at, at doing those jobs. And um, another good thing about PyTorch is that we have uh, some automatic computational gradients, which I'm going to show you what exactly it is in uh, one of the notebook uh, I'm going to um, use today. And uh, one of the things that I personally really like PyTorch is that it really makes uh, things easier when you try to test and develop new ideas or when you try to build up a new uh, deep learning models. I found it really, really useful. And um, the next question is that, why do we choose PyTorch? So um, obviously when people talk about 
um, deep learning, there are many, many frameworks these days, for example, like TensorFlow, uh, which was developed by Google and also Keras, um, which are also pretty popular framework. Um, and also JAX these days, um, which is also developed by Google, uh, I think, and also PyTorch. I think um, all of them are actually pretty good uh, framework, um, like building uh, newer networks. And I personally found PyTorch really uh, useful because like, um, I think there are many, many uh, similarities between PyTorch and NumPy. And uh, I found like just uh, doing, um, like doing PyTorch coding, it's uh, really um, satisfying because you can actually see uh, the computational graph really clear. And, but I mean, all of the framework are actually pretty cool. And so if you're jumping into deep learning, I encourage you to uh, check out all of them and pick one of them that you personally found really comfortable to get it so start started uh, in deep learning. And um, the other cool thing about PyTorch is that because PyTorch now has a really big com communities, and if you are familiar with lots of uh, machine learning conference or lots of machine learning work, you found that a lot of work has been built using PyTorch. And um, also for some other cases, if you have some models or if you have some like tasks, there are usually some of uh, lots of really good wrappers uh, that are built uh, on top of these PyTorch. And uh, two of them I found uh, really uh, useful these days are uh, PyTorch light lighting and fast AI. So. I'm not going to uh, describe what they are in uh, detail in today's tutorial, but if you're interested, I also encourage you to check out. All right, so let's come back to uh, why PyTorch. And um, so the idea of uh, PyTorch is that it's uh, Pythonic, which means that like, you know when you write Python code, it's usually concise and uh, really easy to write. And uh, I think uh, PyTorch itself uh, really carries uh, that spirit in Python, which is uh, really uh, easy to develop. And also, I think uh, a good thing about PyTorch is that they have really good GPU support. So whenever you want to bring up, uh, bring your arrays or bring your torch sensor into GPU, the only thing you need to do is to call the dot CUDA, and that's pretty much it. So uh, I think PyTorch is pretty uh, straightforward in terms of uh, utilizing the power of GPUs. And uh, another good thing about PyTorch is that um, there are actually many algorithms and components that are already implemented uh, within the community. So whenever you have some function that you would like to you call or define, usually it's very likely that someone already developed it. So the only thing that you need to do is just basically call the functions. And as I said, it's pretty similar to NumPy, uh, which is uh, one of the Great, just a Python library if you are doing uh, scientific research. And um, so, as I said, like uh, PyTorch is uh, really uh, good at uh, if you are describing in, in kind of computational graph, it's usually pretty concise to build up. So this plot is a little bit outdated, but um, like um, this was the comparison between like TensorFlow 1.0 and PyTorch. And as you can see at the time, PyTorch was really uh, concise. And, and for me, it's also pretty easy to understand uh, what the code was doing. So this is some uh, benefit of using PyTorch at the time. And so I'm going to jump into some of the um, ideas about what PyTorch is right now. So basically, um, when you use PyTorch, um, it's uh, basically, uh, there's something called the PyTorch tensor. So it's a fundamental blocks of PyTorch. So for example, like in the example right here, if you have two, usually in NumPy, you have two NumPy array, but right here we have two uh, PyTorch tensor. The thing that you need to make it operate is just by importing the torch itself and basically do some modifications or addition on top of it. And you'll see that the result, it's uh, pretty straightforward right here. Um, so the idea is that to give you like a sense of like how PyTorch basically operates right here. And with that, I think I'm going to jump into some of the codes to give you some live demo right here. But before we start, um, uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. 
All right. Cool. Um, so with that, I think I'm actually going to give you some live demo right now. Uh, can you see my notebook? Right. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do right now is that um, I'm going to jump into, is there any questions or? Cool, uh, I'm just going to um, keep going. So um, right now I'm sharing one of the notebook called uh, PyTorch Basics. So uh, if you missed the first half of the talk, feel free to check a link uh, to my GitHub, and there are uh, some codes implemented right here. So in here, I'm going to give you some live demo about well, how to how to use uh, PyTorch. So um, if you are using some other operating systems, like usually what you need to do is to first uh, install it and using a terminal interface. Like usually, if you are um, using Conda or Pip, you can just pretty uh, easily called the uh, copy and paste this in your terminal. And I think uh, PyTorch will be installed right there. And if you're using something like Colab, which is a, a notebook that's directly operates in cloud, you, can, you should be able to just directly uh, use this notebook and reproduce uh, everything I have right here. Right. Um, so the first thing about PyTorch is that one needs to import PyTorch. And one really cool thing, or like one caveat is that when you import PyTorch, because of historical reasons, what you usually do is import Torch instead of PyTorch. And uh, the other things that you might want to check is that you want to check like what kind of versions of PyTorch is. So this is uh, basically a function to do it. And as I said, like, um, when we operate things in PyTorch, uh, usually we operate in from something we call the PyTorch tensor. And right here in this cell, I'm going to give you some demo about like uh, how to make this work. So usually when we have some vector, for example, you want to express right here like data, usually um, in Python, you could easily build up a list and the things to, you, if you want to bring it to the PyTorch format, the only thing you need to do is type in something like torch.tensor and don't forget the capital uh, T right here and put in your data in the functions. And what you'll get is the uh, examples of the 1D data, like one to three right here. And if you have some other higher dimensional data, for example, like if you have a 2D array or 2D data, right here, you can specify your data like this and do the same thing. Then you don't really need to do extra things. Then the torch tensors right here uh, will be updated into uh, basically a 2D tensor arrays uh, right here. And if you have even higher dimensional things, the only thing you need to do is just first define it and do the same thing. And your torch tensor will be exactly the ways that you uh, define it right here. So as you can see, here are some of the examples uh, to um, uh, to basically bring your data into Torch Tensor. So now we know like uh, what the Torch Tensor is. Then um, in some cases you might want to initialize an empty tensors, and the only thing, and in order to do that, the only thing you need to do is basically use something called Torch.empty and basically define the two and three right here is designed, uh, define the shape of the uh, empty tensor you're trying to define right here. And uh, when you first define it, basically um, um, allocates the memory whenever the initial value was uh, stored right there. But this is just uh, one of the ways uh, for you to initiate some kind of a torch uh, tensor. And uh, one really cool thing about uh, PyTorch is that obviously uh, when we do research, there's a lot of chances that we're going to uh, call a random number, like a random float. And usually uh, the question is that if you have a vector or have a, basically a, a matrix, 
uh, can you call all the uh, random number at once using PyTorch? And the answer is yes. And um, so the function that you need to do is just call something uh, torch.rand. And basically when you have this uh, random function, you can basically um, get uh, uh, random flows right here in your tensor, and uh, which is quite convenient when you are trying to do a lot of uh, simulations or uh, just adding some noise in your neural network. This is a really helpful function. And um, also like there are some building functions right here that are also pretty uh, easy to use. Um, so for example, like you might, in some cases, you might just want to have a bunch of zero in your matrix. So the way to call it in PyTorch is also pretty straightforward is that you are basically calling torch.zeros and um, and you given the shape of the tensor, then that's pretty much it. As you can see right here, you are having a bunch of zeros uh, based on the shape you define right here. And one really cool thing about PyTorch is that um, by default, I think uh, you don't usually need to specify like what kind of data type right here. But uh, in some cases, you might want to specify it as uh, low integers or like uh, uh, the other data format. And then the only thing you need to do is that when you first define it, you just type in deep type in, into specific data uh, format that you want. Then the torch uh, tensor will just directly um, give you whatever the type you're specifying right here, which is similar to very similar to NumPy. And um, and right here you also have a different uh, function. Like instead of zeros, you can also call it ones. And when you call it one, usually you just get a, a bunch of tensor uh, with ones and uh, with a shape that is being uh, defined right here. So that's some basic idea about um, how the PyTorch tensor works. And there are many many cool functions uh, to deal with it. And also, like um, there are something called uh, um, random like. So um, the idea is that usually when you have specific matrix and you want to create another matrix that is uh, has the exact shape as that matrix, but you want to randomize the number right there. And there's a, also a pretty cool function that you could call is something we call torch dot random like. So right here we don't need to specify what the shape is, but you want this new array to have the same shape as this old one. So the only thing you need to do is to call this function, and it will return and uh, uh, basically a torch tensor that has uh, exactly the same shape as um, you are given right here as an input. So uh, this is pretty convenient. And also one thing to mention is that I think these random like gives you uh, uh, values that are drawing from Gaussian distributions with a default value. I think mean is equals to zero and standard deviation equals to one, right? Okay, um, so once we have this, um, some functions, then the next thing we could do is like um, basically try to use something we call size um it basically gives you the shape like numpy shape or give you what's the structure um of your tensor right here so whenever you want to check you just call tensor.size and i personally found this function really useful uh especially when you're trying to debug your codes and when you're building your network you don't know what the size of the given matrix is and this uh this uh, function is really helpful right here Right, and so now I think we uh, roughly look at how the uh, get an idea about how the PyTorch uh, tensor works. Now we're going to do, uh, do some operations on top of these uh, PyTorch tensor. And so uh, one of the simplest example I could think of between two tensor or two vector is that you can actually do um, addition on top of these. So in PyTorch, the way to do addition is really straightforward. So for example, like right here, you have two different tensors 
and you want to do uh, addition on top of it, the only thing you need to do is to put down a plus sign between them and define a new variable called Z. And Z will be exactly doing the element-wise uh, addition right here. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, the answer of addition should be five, seven, and nine. And this is exactly uh, what Z is doing. And also you can use some other uh, ways of to do it. Like you can use torch add. This is another uh, building function that you could use. So it will give you the same uh, things. And I think it really depends on uh, when you, um, what's the purpose when you want to do this uh, addition. And in some cases, some of them might, so, might be faster or like uh, uh, in memory case might be more efficient than the others. But right here, I'm just want to give you a broad idea about like there are different ways to do uh, addition in, uh, for PyTorch tensor. Right. And um, also like you could also do something we call the in-place addition. So instead of like uh, defining a new variable like Z, you can actually, if I just want to update my Y and I want to, the way I want to update Y is by adding X. The only thing you need to do is called dot add and uh, underscore then, and, and then that's pretty much you, how you can get the uh, updated array using some in-place addition. So uh, as, as you can see, like these are really uh, convenient tools whenever you just want to do some really simple operations. And obviously, when we have um, um, addition, the next thing you want to do is uh, multiplications, of course. So, um, and one really easy way is that you can just directly um, put down multiplications operations right here. And what you will see is that you could exactly see that the Z, Z is exactly doing element wise. Um, matrix uh, element-wise uh, multiplications. So for example, like when here uh, in given index, you have one and four, so the products of them will be four and uh, two and five will be give you 10 and three and six will give you 18. And this is exactly what uh, PyTorch is doing right here. And um, so obviously when we talk about multiplications, uh, for vector or tensor type of things, usually uh, we not only care about the uh, element-wise multiplication, but there's usually something uh, we call the dot products or the inner products. And um, in PyTorch, and there are obviously some building function that you could do. And uh, right here, one of the example I'm showing right here is you can use uh, math more represent for matrix multiplications and you just, uh, uh, input X and Y, then you can basically get the uh, uh, inner product of these two. And in other cases, uh, one might need to do other products. And so uh, as you can see, like uh, the process is uh, very similar. Uh, right here, you have two uh, tensor. And the only thing that you need to do is basically to call something called torch outer. And you can basically get the, the outer product of these. And one really important thing to notice is that um, when you do matrix um, outer products, usually you need to make sure that the ranks and their, or the shape are right. So in this case, because these two have the same shape. So one thing I did right here is that to call Y dot T, which represent for Y dot transpose. And so as you see, like uh, when you need to call a function transpose in PyTorch, it's really convenient. You just need to put down something dot T. So that's uh, really handy, right? And uh, the next things we are going to look at is um, uh, later on, when we are building neural network, uh, usually you will notice that something called the activation functions or the nonlinear functions uh, right here. So, um, and one of the most famous uh, activation function these days is something we call the ReLU. So uh, let's see how it works in PyTorch. So um, there's usually something we call torch.nn, and there are a lot, lots of really good uh, functions that are related to neural networks. 
that are uh, existing right here. So for example, like if you have an input tensor like this, one and hundred and minus hundred, and if you want to do a ReLU uh, function, you you could just basically define uh, m as an n dot ReLU, and you basically uh, define a new variable z, which uh, basically use m to operate on your input functions right here. And what ReLU do is that it basically if you have a positive value, it keeps the same value, but if you have a negative value, it turns everything into zero. It's sort of like a cutoff right here. So as you can see, like this, uh, uh, and then ReLU is exactly doing like what we are um, asking it to do. So this is really like convenient in causing, uh, uh, calling activation functions uh, in, um, in PyTorch. And obviously, uh, beyond ReLU, there are some other activation function like hypertension. And so right here, I'm just going to give you an example of what hypertension do. Basically, it brings back uh, most of the data from really large values into one, between one and minus one. So this is exactly what uh, uh, hypertension is doing. And, and so as you can see, it's uh, also a really easy operation to do in PyTorch. Right. And the next thing we have right here is that about indexing. So, I mean, um, so I assume some of you are quite familiar with NumPy already. So the way to do this kind of indexing is uh, in PyTorch is basically the same thing. So for example, right here, if I want to get the number one index, um, in this tensor, which includes, so in, Py, in Python, things start counting from zero. So if you're specifying zero index, usually you represent one. And in the first index, you represent, uh, it represents two. And in the second columns, like the index one represents for five. And in order to call these uh, uh, elements in the, um, in the tensor, the only thing you need to do is pretty much just specify like, this is uh, the index that you're interested in. And these uh, basically uh, cause all the possible uh, values that are within this tensor that have uh, correspond to this index one. So as you can see, this is also pretty easy to operate. And the next thing is that usually when you have some tensor and one thing that people usually do a lot, and especially in, for neural networks, that we lots of time we will reshape things um, because of the the needs for the operations. And so one of the ways to do it is like, for example, like if you have a four by four uh, four by four um, uh, torch tensor, and if you want to, oops. You want to um, bring it back to a one-dimensional long vector, then the function corresponding it is something called view. So you, you can basically view it as a long vector. So the only thing you need to do is just call this operation. And um, and if you want to turn this uh, into the other kind of shape, but uh, you don't know like exactly how big this is, but you just only know that. I want to specify one of the uh, one of the uh, length in certain uh, in in one of the dimension. You can actually directly just specify one and replace the other with minus one. So right here, it will automatically figure out like uh, what exactly you are thinking about. So right here, it's turning into uh, uh, two two by eight uh, tensor. Um, by using this view function. So this is uh, also pretty useful. And in other cases, um, there might be something uh, when we want to uh, have extra dimensions uh, on different places. Um, for example, like in, in when you build a neural network, usually there's a lot of batch things that need to worry about and usually want to create extra dimension for certain things. And on GUIs right here is the function that you need to call. And by specifying which index is, it is, you can basically um, 
design like whenever extra index or extra dimension are placing right here. And also the other things that are found really useful is that usually when you have a have a like um, one by one um, tensor and you just if you just want to call a value in that tensor, the only thing you need to do is call something uh, x dot item and it will just directly output a value of your interest. And um, the other thing right here I found um, also useful is that uh, in PyTorch and NumPy, as I said, there are lots of similarities. And in a lot of cases that in research, we want to build something in NumPy first and convert into uh, Torch tensor or vice versa. So in, in PyTorch, there is lots of really uh, easy function to, to call. For example, like if you have a Torch tensor, and if you want to turn into NumPy array, you just basically type in something dot NumPy and it will just automatically do the uh, NumPy thing that you're thinking about. So, which I found really convenient whenever you're trying to uh, convert things back and forth. And for the other cases, like if you start from NumPy, for example, like A is in NumPy once and you want to convert it into a torus tensor, the function you need to do is just type in something called torch dot from numpy uh, from numpy and that pretty much uh, uh, gives you whatever you like for PyTorch. And one thing to notice is that whenever you use this function, I think A and B are associated. So whenever you do some operation on A, your B, which is in, in torch tensor, will change uh, automatically with the operations you are doing right here. So there's just something to uh, be aware of. And right, so the, in the other case, like if you have this and tensor, as, as I showed before, this is basically the way to convert uh, things from tensor into uh, PyTorch. Right. And um, so these are actually quite um, simple operation. So um, right now I'm going to just jump into something uh, I found more uh, related to deep learning is that um, when we want to call a function, usually we want to bring it to uh, GPU. So the first thing about when we call this is that you want to make sure that you're operating on a machine that have GPUs. So the function to check whether CUDA, which uh, uh, it's basically you just call torch.cuda is available and it will tell you like whether your code or this uh, operating system contains a GPU that you could use for your PyTorch device. And um, so right here, um, what I'm doing is that I specify that you are operate, you want to operate on a CUDA device, which is a GPU. And you first specify your tensor and when you specify it by default, I think uh, it's on CPU, but uh, if you want to put something on GPU, the only thing that you need to do is to say, specify like this device is on this uh, CUDA device. And um, basically that's how things operate on GPU, which is like really uh, pretty simple ways to operate it. And right here, I think I'm going to uh, just basically give you some quick demos about how this operates by walking through really quick. And so one of the examples or one of the things when you train your network is that whenever we train your network, there's something called the required grads, uh, which is a required gradients when you do tensor operations. So this is some function that we'll use later on when we build a neural network. And I think due to time, I'm just going to leave this notebook right here and you're feel free to check out the rest of the code. But um, so this is a basic idea about what PyTorch is and yep. So this is uh, how it works in some basic form format. Um, so right here, I don't know whether we have any questions or quick comments.
Right. So uh, in not, if not, then I'm going to um, move to uh, one of the classic examples, uh, which is called the MNIST for image classification task for, uh, for with PyTorch. So um, let me give you some broad idea about how this works. So basically when people, or when, when we study computer vision tasks, and one of the challenges is that if you're looking at so many digits right here, but these are handwritten digits, they all by human eye, we can directly classify them in a second without any problems. But before um, computer algorithm really exist, like each of these data could actually um, being represented by the pixel values could be very different. And for example, like if you are doing some kind of fitting function, uh, sometimes this method wouldn't work so well. And the idea is that, can you have a neural network that given those uh, pixel values, can you uh, directly uh, classify them into different types of data? For example, like right here, here's a three and here's a seven, and they all have uh, different um, values right here. So one of the, uh, really good tools about these uh, neural network, especially for images, is that people use something called a convolutional neural network. So, um, and the idea about these convolutional neural network is that they are building uh, with different layers of operations, including convolutions and something max pooling, and usually there's some activation function behind it. And in the last few layers, you usually want to uh, bring them back to, into the data shape. For example, like in, in this case, our data have like from zero to nine. So you basically want to bring an image which have a 22 times 22, 28 20, times 28 dimension back into this data, uh, back into this uh, vector space, which has uh, a shape of 10. And so the way the neural network do, uh, the neural network operates is that they do some kind of convolutional operations on top of the input image. So as you can see right here, what convolutional do is that it basically has a convolutional kernel, which as you can see, there are some digits or some floating number on top of it. And you basically do uh, matrix uh, operations um, of it. And you basically scan through the kernels on your input data. So usually, um, in convolutional neural network, there are some something we call the down sample by uh, doing convolution, which are going to see in a second. And there are also something we call the uh, uh, activation function, which uh, here are a few samples right here that people usually use. And to give you a comparison, these are the linear function, which are uh, this important here. And um, also I think in a convolution neural network, there's something called the max pooling. So the idea of max pooling is that it basically try to reduce the size of the data by picking out the maximum value in the certain selected areas. So for example, like right here, we have a four by four matrix. And if we put the max pool uh, function on top of these and specify certain parameters, and uh, what you get is that, for example, in the blue part, it basically gets the maximum value like five right here. In the green part, it gets the maximum value like nine and et cetera, et cetera. So you basically are reducing the size of the input by only keeping the maximum value as the, the information you thought that's uh, really important right here. And also when you train a neural network, there's something we call the loss functions. And in the case of classifications, there are something we call the cross entropy functions, which basically takes in uh, two kinds of distributions, which I'm going to show you in a second really quick what the idea is, but this is uh, basically the, the format of the equations. And so the idea is that when you train a neural network, it not only output which class it is, but it actually gives you, or as you was thinking about, like which class has the higher probabilities. So right here, what you're really training is that, for example, like I think this one has a higher probability. Um, so I give in a score of 0.7 and for the other two, I thought the probabilities are low. So I give in lower value. 
And the idea is that you are basically doing a function optimizations using this cross entropy loss and to, in order to get the best uh, accuracies right here. And the algorithm behind how you train this neural network is something we call the back propagations, which I'm not going to jump into detail today. But right here, what I'm going to do is to actually build a neural network using PyTorch and give you some live demo and let's see how it works. Okay, so let's do this. So I already have this. Um, so before I jump into detail, I want to make sure that, um, is there any quick questions? All right, and if not, then I'm going to jump into the code. So um, basically when you are training uh, convolutional neural networks using PyTorch, Usually there are some functions that you need to uh, import just for the sake of like, uh, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to describe what they are, but some of the things I would like to point out that are fine, really important are like, usually you will import something like a function of things. And uh, when you do optimization, you import your optimizer, which is built in PyTorch and usually will track down, you want to track down the gradient informations uh, right here. So you uh, import something we call variable right here. And right here. So right here, I'm going to give you some live demo about what it is. And here are some hyperparameters that are defined right here. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to jump into too much detail. So right here, what we are doing in this cell is that we are basically downloading data uh, using some of the building function in PyTorch. So if you have some default data, uh, you can just directly use a torch vision to download it, which is uh, super, super, help super helpful um, and usually saves you a lot of time. And usually when you train a supervised learning algorithm, you want to split your data into training and testing sets or training and validation testing set for more rigorous reason. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to split them into train and test sets right here. And now once you have this function, I'm going to uh, basically uh, plot out what the data is. So as you can see right here, we have lots of these uh, handwritten digits just by uh, Point, uh, just by picking out the first five uh, uh, training data. So you know that these are in your training sets. And one really important check before you do any um, machine learning training is that to check whether your testing data uh, exclude all your training data. Just, uh, just So this is just a, some, some check that I usually uh, do before I start. So as you can see right here, we know that these two are different, so we're good to go. And right here, this is a convolutional neural network I described earlier, and I'm going to uh, build almost exactly the same neural network using PyTorch um, according to this plot. So here we go. So when you use a PyTorch to build a convolutional neural network, you usually define a class and uh, put in an end up module right here. And what you want to do right here is to let it have some operation predefined in your init functions right here. And for example, like right here in this convolution and neural network, I want to have two types of convolution. So um, I first, uh, or two, two layers of different convolutions. So I first define the first convolutions as a two dimensional convolution because that these, this is a two dimensional image and I want to do a ReLU function afterwards. And I also want to do a max pooling with a stride of two and a kernel size of two by two. So right here, what you can do is exactly specify the, the things that you need to do right here. And as I said that when calling this function, I feel like PyTorch is uh, really convenient because when you want to specify your kernel size or stride, 
the only thing you need to do is to specify all the parameter within the nn.conf.2d function right here. And the similar things that you could do is to uh, define the second uh, convolutions right here. And one of the things that uh, pe when people are doing convolutional neural networks is that usually you have multiple convolutional, uh, you have different convolutional kernels. And so usually you, when, for example, like right here, you have an input image, which uh, has in its Z direction, you only have uh, one dimension, but when you do convolution, you apply, you actually want to try different convolutional kernel so you can get different combination of it. And uh, as you can see right here, I think the convolutional kernel, it's turning it into a 32 channel things, which is something I specify right here. And after max folding, uh, you will just, uh, uh, it will keep its uh, channel value, but because it's doing max folding, and you would uh, shrink the size, the 2D size of the feature, feature maps right here into 14 by 14. And uh, as you go into the second convolution, it basically takes in these uh, 32 uh, channel things and turn it into a 64 channel things by uh, this uh, second convolutional. Uh, and in this case, because I'm sort of like know what the definition of these, uh, how to call this uh, parameters. So right here, I actually didn't specify them. So this is something you could also do in PyTorch. Um, just uh, if you're really familiar with it, then you know what's the default, default places to call these uh, parameters is. And at the last layer, what I did is that I basically, uh, uh, want to build a linear function, which is something we call the multi-layer perception and the last layer to basically uh, hook up the data back into a dimension of 10, which represents for zero to nine. And, and after defining all this uh, data, this structure of the convolutional neural network, next thing one needs to do is to do a forward function um, by passing through the data into different layers of operations. So for example, like right here, X usually represents for your input data, which is a two dimensional uh, Hamilton digits. And right here, you pass it through this first, um, the first convolutional operations you define right here. So it's basically includes convolutional, your value function and max polling. And now we specify this one as X. And then you want to pass this X which is something we already got right here into the other sequential of operation, which is something we define called convolutional two. And after passing them, you basically reach this stage of the uh, convolutional uh, neural network operations. Then the thing we want to do right here is basically to return all the things in 64 by seven by seven shape into a really long vector right here. So as I, uh, as you might remember that we, the function to do right here is exactly called the view function. So basically turning all this uh, higher dimensional thing into a vector. And um, so, and the last layer is just like, uh, you basically use a, a fully connected layer to uh, operate on these dome vector and you get your output. So that's the basic structure of these uh, CNN. And the way you want to call the CN is by just uh, calling the CN. And one really cool thing about it is that when you want to operate, want it to operate on GPU, as I said, you just call CN.CUDA, then your um, uh, your neural network itself will be operating on GPUs. And as I said, that we are using some optimizer, which is in, in this case, I'm using add an optimizer. Um, but I'm not going to explain the detail of what Adam Optimizer is, but it's, the idea is that it's basically some uh, gradient descent method for you to uh, do optimization. And right here, we are using cross entropy loss functions. And so when you specify all these things, then the other cool thing is that you want to check how many parameters or what's the size of your neural network and the thing that I found really uh, useful is that there's usually something called torch summary. So you can just import the summary functions and, uh, 
and it basically can give you an idea about what's the shape of each uh, convolution and how many parameters are being used right there at different layers. So this is something I found really helpful when you're trying to understand a neural network that uh, you're building. And so right here, I'm going to start training a neural network. And usually when we train a neural network, you train multiple e epochs. So the idea is that you have a training set and you want your neural network to see uh, this kind of training set multiple times so that it gains better performance. And, um, and usually when you train it, usually we, we train it in a batch. So usually there's something we call the train loader, which is uh, basically bringing your data into batch, batch things, which I think uh, some of the, uh, I'm not going to explain how it works in detail, but I think uh, some of the other uh, tutorials might cover how these uh, data loader actually works. So right here, I'm just going to uh, loading some of the data, my X and Y, which X represent for image and Y represent for its label and um, use a convolutional neural network to um, output its value. And at this line, I'm calculating the loss function by comparing how my performance is with the ground truth label right here using cross entropy uh, loss function we defined right here. And basically I append a loss history so that um, you can basically get an idea about how this uh, being trained uh, right here. So I think right here, I'm going to, oops, I think I already trained this one before. So this is uh, operating really fast, but let me start. training it again in real time so that you can see like uh, the neural network is actually training right here. And as you can see, like original, its accuracy was really bad. It's only get 10% right, which is almost like a random guess. But after a few uh, iteration, the convolutional uh, neural network actually improved its accuracy pretty quickly to almost uh, 98%. And the cool thing about training on GPU is that uh, the operation time is way faster than training on CPU. So right here, we just train a convolutional neural network in, in eight seconds. And usually I did an experiment on CPU. Usually it will take like four to five minutes to train it on a CPU uh, using exactly the same operations. So uh, training on GPU is a really uh, fast way to uh, let your neural network learn. And this is a loss function we have. So usually you'll see lots of plot like this, like your loss function will be uh, uh, getting lower and lower as the, as the time you train. And usually if you reach a really good spot, you will sort of saturate it right here. So that's uh, usually when you decide to stop training your algorithm. And after training this neural network, uh, one good thing is to see how well it performs on specific data. So right here, I just pick up 10 of the data from my test sets, and I uh, try to see what their output is by these trained neural network. Um, so as you can see right here, like what we have is like uh, the neural network are predicting the below image as a seven on GPU. And this looks like a seven to me. And right here, in this case, the neural network predicted this is a two, and this is a one, and this is a zero, and this is a four. So as you can see, like the neural network actually learns how to uh, classify digits in the really, um, really efficient way. Um, so I found this uh, really interesting. And usually, uh, I'm pretty curious about like when does the neural network fail? So right here. I'm going to show you one of the example that uh, when neural network fails. So right here, this is an example of given this image, the neural network actually predict it's an eight, but the actual answer is three. But I mean, in some sense, it's actually pretty cool to found that in some sense, I can tell like why neural network think this is an eight because I mean, it's, it's not that bad. I wouldn't call this a really bad prediction. If it's predicted in a zero or a nine, I think I would call this a bad prediction. But 
as you can as you can see, human might sometimes make this kind of errors as well. So I found these are really interesting to just basically visualize when does the neural network fail. All right, so right here before we jump into the next example, I was wondering whether there's uh, any questions. So I saw something in the chat, but I wasn't able to see it right now. Okay. I, I think we have a user asking, are the alt channel is set arbitrary or based on some considerations? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, um, I think there are two ways to look at it. So usually in the intermediate layers, the, the channel, it's, I personally will think it's a, it's a hyperparameter that you can tune. So usually there's no specific reason that we set this as 32 or 64. Um, but the idea for them to be, uh, be a value that is not bad though, is that you can actually preserve, imagine it, sort of do a lot of operations and you can sort of preserve different kinds of levels of operations information so that your neural network could be functional better in those hidden channels. And for the channel at the last layer, usually it's uh, the class of uh, the size of the class that you have in this data. So for example, like for Henry 10 digits, obviously we know there are zero to nine. So there are 10 different classes. But if it's other data, for example, like there's something called the image net, which contains a thousand different types of things. And the last layer in those type of neural net where you found that the last layer will output the, uh, something a size equal to the size of a thousand, because that's how many different classes that you're going to have in that particular, particular data set. Yeah. Yes, and uh, if I may, I wanna add something that uh, the number of 32 is uh, actually a magical number uh, in the GPU computing. So that's why if we choose uh, 32, 64, 128, uh, which will benefit for the GPU to parallel, uh, parallel our computational task to get better performance. All right, yeah, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. I think that's uh, also like, yeah, when people design it, uh, there's usually uh, computational reasons behind it. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for the uh, uh, comments. That's uh, really helpful. All um, is there any other quick questions or? Yeah, let me actually move forward to the uh, generative models because I found that example is uh, really interesting. So, um, let's come back to the slides. So right now, I see, uh, as I show you that we can really use PyTorch in real time, like in eight seconds to train a neural network to recognize digits to really high accuracies. And um, that's uh, something we call the classifications as a supervised learning uh, ways of doing things. But I mean, um, in a lot of cases, uh, when we talk about machine learning, we not only want it to classify things, but we want our neural network to generate new data. Um, so right here, there are obviously multiple ways of doing it. And, and some of the ways are what we call the generative adversarial networks, which you have a generator and discriminator. They are both neural network to compete with each other. And, but today I'm going to give you an uh, example, which is something we call the variational autoencoder, which uh, abbreviates at VAE. So I think that these are two are the most popular uh, generative models these days, but uh, I also want to mention there's something called the normalizing flow, which I personally found really cool, but due to the time, I'm not going to uh, describe what it is today. So um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about how VAE works. So the idea about how VAE works is that you have some input image or some input data, you pass it through an encoder. And in our case, your encoder will be neural network 
it can be convolutional neural network or a multi-layer perceptron, but it depends on the case. And right here, you'll have an information bottleneck. So information bottleneck is the place that you store your representations of the data. And usually your representation in this bottleneck will be smaller or way smaller than the dimension of your input uh, image. And in, in this case, like uh, it's basically trying to uh, store, uh, store as much as possible of the information from the input image using fewer parameters. And the decoder is basically uh, uh, also another neural network in our case to bring like whatever parameter that is stored in this bottleneck back to the reconstructed uh, space, which ha usually has the same dimension as your input. So, and to give you one of the examples about how I think of these variational autoencoder works is that usually in image, there's lots of degrees of freedoms. But uh, one thing you'll notice is that usually the data in a real life um, or in some of these data sets are actually not that complex. So for example, in one of the simple case, you can think of if you have a data set that are only containing a bunch of zeros in their image. And if you want to find the parameter ways of describing this image, the only thing you need to do is basically figure out where, how, what's the radius of that circle in that image and what's the center of the location. And you can basically only use two parameters to describe whatever information is that image, even though it might be a 28 by 28 dimension, which has a lot of freedom. So the idea about this uh, variational autoencoder, it's basically um, you are trying to find a good representation that you can encode and decode information uh, right here. And usually when we uh, use variational autoencoder, you can actually tune some of the parameters in those representation space so that they you're sort of like perturbing them a little bit. So you can actually create some of the new data uh, from this uh, bottleneck using the same decoder, right? And so right here, I'm going to give you a quick demo about how this actually works um, as a decoder. So right here, let's see, let's see, let's see, here we go. So right here, I'm building a neural network that is very simple form of variational autoencoder so as you can see, they are similar to the previous network I built, except that right here, I'm using something called a multi-layer perceptron to represent its encoder and decoder parts. So they are all linear layers with activation function between, the, uh, between them. So uh, usually there are a few dimensions that you need to specify, but due to time, I wouldn't uh, uh, talk about their details. But the idea about variational autoencoder is that we are basically assuming that your data could be living in the space that could be approximated by a Gaussian. So what you want your representation space to be output to have is like basically represent for mean values and the log variance of your distributions. And then your decoder is basically bring this Z, like your representation back into the real space. And so, and this is the for function that you basically pass in certain like uh, input through the encoder and you get these two values or two, two vectors and you are resampling then you basically decode them. And when you do the decoding process, like, um, um, it's uh, basically trying to uh, restore whatever, try to make the decoded, uh, reconstructed images as close as its input as a way uh, to define it. And um, right here, I think because this is a generative model, so the loss function is uh, slightly different than the way we do cross entropy. And in most, uh, Vanilla variational autoencoder, I think people use something called the uh, evidence or bound uh, as their loss function, EOBO. But due to the time, I'm not going to uh, explain what it is, but rather leave you the function right here. And if you are interested, you are, feel free to uh, explore it online. But right here, I'm just going to define how you train a neural network 
train the variation autoencoder. Uh, so the training process is pretty similar to the previous CNN. But one thing that is different is that we are actually not doing it in a supervised way. So that means we actually are not using the label provided right here. We're just basically looking at the image without knowing that these are one, these are two, these are different digits. We just treat them as all image data and try to uh, see whether we can train our neural network to generate new uh, digits that wasn't in the training sets. So right here, I'm going to train a, a variational autoencoder in real time. And usually because when you're training a generative model, it usually takes longer than uh, generating a classifier. So this might take uh, more time. But in this case, I think it's going to take less than uh, five minutes. So i um, just going to wait and see what will happen. And as you can see right here, the loss function is dropping uh, with time. So I think now the test is finished right here. And one thing I would like to mention is that um, in this variational autoencoder, I'm doing something uh, pretty radical, which uh, I'm doing an experiment to try to see whether I can only use two parameters to describe the whole handwritten digits can we can we use only two parameters to, to describe them and generate new data so after training let's see how it actually works so right here um i am generating new data by uh specifying what the hidden dimension is so right here i only have two parameters but I want to use this two parameter to generate a uh, Hamilton digits that wasn't in the in in the data set itself. So I just right here, I just randomly pick two numbers like minus 0.04 and minus 2.1. And as you can see, the neural network actually learns how to generate new data just by giving these uh, two parameters. And one thing you could also notice is that the quality of the data wasn't that good. So because this is a in my point of view, this wasn't fully optimized, but rather just to give you an idea about how this generative models works. Um, but as you can see that these are the new seven that was uh, definitely not in the training sets uh, itself. And one really cool thing is that I usually don't know how this representation space look like. So usually one thing I would do is that I'll just poke around with these uh, bottleneck or the parameters in the representation space to see how what kind of new data I can generate. So as, as you can see, if I change one of the value right here, it start generating the new digits right here, which is still seven. But as you can see, it looks definitely different from the previous sevens you have. So imagine you want to generate lots of these numbers. The only thing you need to do is just basically poking around and changing some values right here in the hidden representations. And I personally have a lot of fun because I, as I said, I don't really know uh, what kind of space they're living at. So I just uh, change the parameters and see what they look like. And as you can see, this is still seven, but it looks very different uh, from what I previously have. And right here, oh, um, when I change the yellow value, actually I start getting something like a zero or a six. So um, I have a lot of fun playing with these because I really don't know what usually come out of it. So right here, I think it's a, it's a better looking zero. Generate new data just by using a functional autoencoder. And even with a really low uh, dimension of hidden representation, it can still do pretty uh, impressive works as far as I, as I can tell, All right? And usually some of them do capture different uh, things like the thickness or the size of the data. So yeah, just uh, having a lot of fun playing with it, right? Yeah, so uh, one really cool thing about, and actually, I mean, it might be an active research, just that how do these data are living in this uh, 
representation space. So uh, here's a little experiment I did is that I tried to sample one of the parameters in my information bottleneck from minus two to two. And then um, basically I try to generate 10 different sets of data right here uh, using this range of parameters. So as you can see, like, um, because we only squash these data into two parameter space. So each parameters might uh, actually covers a lot of different uh, digits in our data set. So as you can see, this looks like a seven, but as the value goes up, it starts looking like a nine and then start looking like an eight and start looking like a one. So basically you can imagine like your data is sort of like li living in the lower dimensional space and variational autoencoder is basically helping you do uh, this kind of process right here. And you can also like uh, sample it with different like uh, Z2 value. So right here, I think it's a seven and one. So usually I have a lot of fun playing with this uh, variational autoencoders and using PyTorch. And also like, as you can see, like to build these uh, variational autoencoder and CN with PyTorch, it's actually pretty simple and you can train a lot of things uh, with GPUs in real time. So uh, I personally have a lot of fun with it. So if you're uh, start learning deep learning, I, yeah, I strongly encourage you to uh, explore more of PyTorch. Um, yep. So I think with that, I think I'll stop right here and take questions. Thank you. Well, I guess if you don't have any questions, then uh, uh, probably we are done with today's tutorials. Joshua, thank you very much for delivering such an excellent tutorial. This will be recorded and posted online. We really appreciate having these tutorials available for our users of our system. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thank you all. Take care.